are proud and pleased to feature our gubernatorial energy forum. Um, and we, are, we have Commissioner Phil Jones here, Commissioner of the Utility Transportation Commission, to moderate this next session. He is a friend. He is a colleague for us. He has been part of our partnership for the last three years. He was chair of the Northwest Energy Efficiency Task Force, which uh, the workforce section, which is when I met him. And he came to the Center of Excellence along with Cal Shirley, Puget Sound Energy, and asked how we could work together across the region to build this workforce for energy efficiency. So it is my pleasure to turn the mic over to Commissioner Jones. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here again today. I don't think I came last year, but I came the year before. I missed your crab feed last night. Um, I heard you had a great time. So it's a pleasure to be here and to, uh, to talk energy policy for the state of Washington between the two campaigns. And as many of you know, energy infrastructure is the key to jobs, construction, and also to the economic vitality of our state. So leading off today with, and I won't take long on introductions, will be, we have the two campaigns. We have the actual candidate, Jay Inslee, and we have a representative for the McKenna campaign, Todd Myers. So Jay will go first. He is a very dynamic, capable guy. He straddled both sides of the mountains. He served one term in Congress on the, on the east side of the Cascades, and he served seven terms representing the first district uh, for the state of Washington. Um, he serves on the Energy and Commerce Committee, which is the key committee for energy and commerce. He's been very active on that committee. He had a lot to do, I think, with certain legislation uh, in the House, as well as I-937. So the way we're going to structure this is Jay will go first, make three, three minutes on what he sees, three to five minutes on the energy policy for the state of Washington. He will sit down. We'll go to Todd. And then I have a series of four or five areas of questioning that I will moderate the discussion. And we'll go for about a half an hour. So Jay, the floor is yours. Uh, why don't you use the mic and stand up here? Okay, I'll do that. And I'll just stand right over here. Uh, thank you. My name is Jay Inslee. This is an absolute delight to be here with people who understand the economic potential of energy in the state of Washington. Uh, I'm running for governor of the state of Washington so that we can build a working Washington. So we can use our powers of innovation and our powers of good practices in construction to get people back to work. And I have a plan to do that. And I'm absolutely thrilled to be amongst people who see the potential for our state when it comes to energy. I've had a lot of jobs in my life. I've driven bulldozers in Bellevue. I've painted houses in Burien. I've run a jackhammer, I've driven a cement truck, I've washed dishes and waited tables, I've prosecuted drunk drivers, I've taught some community college classes. But this job now that we have before us is one of the greatest opportunities I've been involved to get working people to work. And now I have believed in the power of energy to create jobs for some time. About five years ago, I wrote a book about it. I wrote a book about how we can use energy policy to create jobs. And I've been engaged in this battle now to create jobs through energy for several years. Uh, through uh, efforts in Congress to develop policies to put people to work, to our efforts in our initiatives, to our efforts in homegrown policies to put people back to work. And here's why I'm thrilled to be here. We are seeing the seeds of job creations across our state. We are seeing the Western Hemisphere's largest manufacturer of silicon substrate that can go into solar cells in Moses Lake, Washington at the REC company. We see the Western Hemisphere's largest production of energy efficiency services today in Seattle and Spokane in McKinsey and McDonald Miller. You can ask where the world's most durable solar energy cell is made. It's made in Marysville, Washington at the silicon energy plant. I started this morning in Tacoma, where the uh, a company is getting ready to build the first hybrid electric lithium-ion battery, pure non-CO2 emitting tugboat for the United States Navy at the Martinac Shipping Company. And we look across this state, and when I see wind turbines, I see jobs of electrical workers, of steel workers, of longshoremen who've helped 
transport turbines back and forth. I see jobs when I think of energy. So I'm thrilled to be here with you to talk about practices that are going to put people to work through the power of energy. Thanks very much. Todd. Todd, before you start, I'm just going to introduce you. Okay. Um, uh, Todd Myers, he's also a Husky, by the way. Jay, I, I, I forgot to say that Jay was a Husky. Todd is too. And my purple tie. But he went to Whitman first, uh, where my daughter is actually. So he has two, two scores in my view. So he went to Whitman, got his BA in politics. Interestingly, he, uh, Jackson School, Russian International Studies at the Jackson School. Todd is now president of Todd Myers Communications, which is a consulting firm involved in bioscience and energy and public relations consulting. He also worked as the communications director for the Commissioner of Public Lands, Doug Sutherland, which is, as many of you know, very involved in siting of transmission facilities and siting of wind farms in this state. So Todd, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate being here. Let me just say, before I went to Whitman, actually, I spent a year at Bellevue Community College. Um, and it was important because I didn't have the money uh, to go to Whitman and community colleges are extremely uh, personal to me and I understand that uh, last night at the Crab Feed you raised some money for scholarship to help people pay for incidentals. I can tell you that I delivered pizzas to cover my incidentals. Um, so it's, I'm really uh, proud of what you guys are doing. Um, so I am representing Attorney General McKenna. Um, uh, I will try to represent his views as much as possible. Um, so just think of me as General McKenna with a worse hairdo. <laughs> Rob believes, I think, of two key things on this. First is, is he is for broad-based job growth, and not just sort of the approach, the political approach of picking and choosing winners, favoring some businesses over others. He's colorblind to the jobs that we need to create. And while we want to certainly create good, clean energy jobs, we want to create jobs in other sectors as well, across the board. And making sure that you have inexpensive power, a fair playing field, regulatory certainty, lowers worker, uh, workers' comp and unemployment insurance costs, and especially an educated workforce, all contribute to not just helping one sector, but helping all sectors. And it is that way that you create true economic growth. Speaking of an educated workforce, it's clear that we need to find a way to fully fund our K-12 system, invest more in early education and STEM, which of course, as you know, is science, technology, engineering, um, and math, and stop defunding our universities. We know we need higher levels of degree attainment, and that's why it's disappointing that we've seen over the last 20 years when we've had Democratic governors and Democratic control, we've seen such a uh, decline in the funding that we've had. Attorney General McKenna will reverse that decline and make sure that we can train our kids in the education that they need. But unfortunately, I think we have a different approach uh, from the congressman about how to improve the clean energy sector and to create those jobs. And let me just uh, say that it's, it, it sort of reminds me of, I don't know if you've been to Chilkoot Charlie's, it's a bar in Anchorage. Not, not many people were willing to claim that they've been to Chilkoot Charlie's, I admit, <laughs> but they have a slogan on the door and you walk in the door and it says, we cheat the other guy and pass the savings on to you. <laughs> And I think, unfortunately, too often, that's the approach that we take. And if you read, the congressman, congressman mentioned that he wrote a book about clean energy. And in that book, he mentioned, actually, some opportunities and what he thought were going to be the future. And he said, and I quote, that Grays Harbor is the model that we ought to look at, where we're sitting right now. And he gave two examples, Imperium Renewables and Grays Harbor Paper. Unfortunately, in just the three years that he wrote the book, Imperium Renewables has been running almost consistently below capacity, and Grays Harbor Paper, as you may know, closed down last year. The result is, is that Grays Harbor's economy is suffering, and just two days ago, it was announced that in the new unemployment statistics, that Grays Harbor County has the highest unemployment rate in the state. Just three years ago, Congressman Inslee tried to say that Grays Harbor was the model of the green economy, and we're seeing the results of that. The problem is, is that when you focus on one sector, when you try to pick winners and losers, the result is, is that sometimes you get it wrong. There is a better way, and that is to educate everybody, to find a variety of new ways to improve energy technology, to improve conservation, to create those jobs, so that we're not picking and choosing, we're not putting all our eggs in one basket, as Spain had with their green economy, and with other com countries that can no longer afford the subsidies. That's a better approach education, diversification, and seeing the way that we can make all sectors prosper is the way forward for Washington. Thanks so much. Thank you. Just
just keep that time. So now I'm going to ask a series of questions, and uh, I'm going to roam around here a little bit. So uh, the first question I'll pose to Jay uh, first, and then you, Todd. Given the overall workforce is, is uh, aging, and 50% will retire in the near future, this conference is focused on workforce education of energy workers. And some people call it a demographic cliff you know, for utilities, vendors, and everybody. And I think you're, both of you are aware of this. So what would, what would be your specific policies, community college, technical education, et cetera, et cetera, that, that you would propose to deal with this demographic cliff? First, Jay. Well, let me suggest it's not just a demographic cliff. It is a huge skills gap in our state. Uh, we are first in a per capita number of technical jobs that we have today, but we are 45th or 46th in the production of the students that can actually fulfill those high-tech jobs. We essentially are importing children from around the states and around the world to fill jobs that our children and our students should be prepared to do. And we need to eliminate that skills gap. Now, there's a number of things we have to do. We have to start by making sure that we have better STEM, science, technology, engineering, math uh, progress in our K through 12 system so that our students are prepared whether they're going to a four-year degree or a community college or a technical college or an apprenticeship prog uh, program to make sure they have the science, technology, and math uh, performance skills to be ready post-graduation. We are not doing that today. Somewhere between 40 and 60% of our students that enter community colleges really need some remediation in either a science or, or a math to be prepared to move forward. So it starts with an emphasis on STEM um, uh, education in our K through 12 system. Now to help on that, we need better STEM education for our K through, uh, through 12 teachers themselves. Now in our college system, we have a misalignment of our resources. We have a misalignment where today we have 5,200 computational informatics jobs available two years ago, but only 2,000 graduates from our systems. We need to align the production of our degrees with the, uh, with the jobs that are there in the skill set. We are not aligning them. To do that, as we start to backfill the cuts that have taken place to higher education, we have to make sure that they are prioritized on those degree programs that, in fact, will help people fill those jobs sets. Now, to go to back for a minute, back from, from our college system, we've got to make sure that every student has a vision for their path to a middle-class job. And that includes those in the trades. And I say this because too often we forget people who have a good, viable middle-class possibility in the trades. That means we should provide all of our students with access to skills centers in our K through 12 system. Right now, those students, not all those students, have access to a skills system, skill center, excuse me, that set them up to perhaps enter into an apprenticeship program in a, in for the IBW members, for machinists, for steel workers, for dental hygienists. And I got to tell you, when I go to these skills center and I see these kids doing this work, they are so excited. They are thrilled. They are connected to their education, and we've got to make sure that they've got access to do that. Last thing I'll mention is that obviously we have to help our kids with this enormous crushing debt burden that they have when they're going to four and even two-year uh, colleges. And I have proposed reestablishing the system of the state providing low-cost loans uh, to, in fact, go to our students to help limit the interest uh, payments that they are making on their student loans. Now, I have to express disappointment to some of my Republican colleagues on this in Congress who have resisted this low-cost loan program, and I have to express disappointment in my friends across the aisle who, when, finally, when given, for the first time in years, budgetary authority, what did the Republicans do in Olympia? Very first thing they did, they cut $74 million from the higher education budget. And the Democrats, thank goodness, stopped them from their ability to do that. We need to invest more resources in a feasible way to do it. Uh, I don't know if you want to go into that, but my time is probably up. Yeah. Thank you, Jay. Um, Todd, what would Attorney, Gen Attorney General McKenna do on, on this topic? Well, 
it's nice to hear that the congressman is concerned about education funding. Attorney General McKenna is very concerned about it. I wish the congressman had been concerned prior to this year uh, when the Democrats have controlled the state for the last eight years. Funding has been cut dramatically. And as I've said, I have a very personal commitment to uh, community colleges and the work that they do in training. And I have seen the cuts that have come both in terms of college um, and in community college. And we need to do that. But we can't just focus on one sector or the other and pick winners and losers because not only is the loser the economy, the loser are the students. We have a couple of green jobs and green jobs programs up in Snohomish and North King County that told people, told students, come in and train for two years, take out loans, high interest, low interest, and we'll get you a green job. And those programs have had to scale back because 80% of the students were failing to find jobs. We told them, we encouraged them to get into a sector that we promised them would find a job, and now we have left those folks with two years of debt and time lost, and they still have no job. That's the fundamental problem with focusing too, too much on a particular sector, and we see the results um, with low employment in those sectors. And so that's the commitment that we have to make to all sectors across the board. You heard in the previous panel them talking about troubleshooting, right? And somebody who has troubleshooting experience can apply it in a variety of different ways. And that's where we really need to focus, are on those skills that are applicable in all different areas, rather than pick and choosing particular sectors. Attorney General McKenna believes that we ought to provide our students with all of the opportunities. Find their gifts. All of our students have a gift. And rather than tell students, this is the way of the future, or this is the way of the future, encourage them in their gifts. When Dan Evans left office in 1976, if he had said, 20 years from now, Washington State is going to be the leader in computer software, coffee capital of the world, and we're going to lead, we're going to create a revolution in internet book sales, they probably would have said, it's a good thing Governor Evans is leaving because none of those things would have even seemed possible 20 years later. And yet that, 20 years later, is where Washington State is. Trying to predict where we're going to be 10 and 20 years from now. Or as you can see with the, with the congressman's book, even three years ago, it's very difficult. Training people to be flexible, to have the skills, to meet those new demands is where to go, not trying to pick and choose winners and losers. Thank you, Todd. Well, that's a good segue into my next question, which is Initiative 937. And I think you're probably going to say, Todd, that's picking winners and losers, and Jay may say something else. So my question is, you had quite a bit to do with I-937, I think, uh, Congressman. So it deals both with RPS, Renewable Portfolio Standards, 15% by 2020, but also with energy efficiency. It requires the utilities to do all cost-effective, technical and feasible energy efficiency. Our commission now is implementing the rules for the IOUs and Department of Commerce implementing the rules for the munis and the PUDs. So could you address both aspects of I-937, the RPS side, energy efficiency side, and what would you do to change it if you want to change it, or should we just keep it going as is and have us, the Commission, and Department of Commerce implement the rules for the utilities? Jay, you well, first. I'd be happy. Traditionally, we alternate. If you'd like, to, I'm trying to be fair here to my okay. my newfound friend here and <laughs> Todd. <laughs> Todd, so why I, don't you go first? Yeah. So the, I think the key question with Initiative 937 is what's the goal? The goal is to uh, help the environment, to reduce carbon emissions. Um, and so uh, I think there's two fundamental questions about 937 and whether it's achieving that goal. Is it helping the environment, and does it help the economy? And I think, unfortunately, there are some problems in both of those areas that are going to require flexibility in the future. The first is, does it help the environment? And in a lot of cases in Washington state, the answer is no. So take the city of Seattle. Seattle City Light prides itself on being uh, zero carbon, carbon neutral. And that the way that they do that is with about 90% or 85% hydro, about 10% nuclear, and then 5% miscellaneous, including wind and a variety of other things. Forcing them to go to three, and then nine, and then 15 percent renewable by 2020 is simply substituting clean energy for clean energy, low-cost clean energy for high-cost clean energy. So you're not getting the advantage. Washington State is already very decarbonized, especially uh, with our electricity sector. And so the question is, what is the marginal benefit that we're getting from 937 in terms of the environment? And it's very low. And I think that you have to see that if we're going to make a difference, it's going to be in other areas. 
The second question then is, okay, so what's the cost? Maybe it doesn't have a big impact on the environment, but what's the cost? And the challenge is, is that it's not just Washington State that has an RPS, it's Oregon. Right? We passed a 15% RPS by 2020. Oregon then turned around, always wanting to do one better, said 25 by 25, and now California is up to 33%. And so now we're competing with the, all of those states for that clean energy. And right now we have a surplus, but as those targets start to kick in, that competition will get very intense. Um, and the cost of that renewable energy, as those states compete with those very inflexible RPSs, the energy prices will go up. The reason that uh, we have solar in Moses Lake, that we have BMW looking to build parts for electric cars, is they said the key thing was your low electricity rates. And ironic, it would be ironic to undermine that advantage we have to get those clean energy jobs and to get those folks here to undermine the very advantage that those renewable and clean energy companies said that we had by driving up our electricity rates and making those sectors less affordable. You're simply trading off one for another. So Initiative 937 has some problems. I know there's a lot of people talking about creating more flexibility, but fundamentally I think that's what you have to keep in mind is that it's not a goal in and of itself, it is a tool, and if it's not actively achieving the goal of helping the environment and keeping us economically competitive and risking others, then you have to find that flexibility and make some changes. Todd, you didn't uh, answer uh, entirely my question, so let me fine tune this a little bit more. So would Attorney General McKenna be in favor of changing 937, fine tuning it, more flexibility or not, and just keep it short. Abs absolutely. I think Attorney General McKenna is, is looking at others about how do we count, what counts as renewable. Like I said, the city of okay. Seattle, they count uh, clean, they count both nuclear and hydro as carbon neutral. I don't know that Attorney General McKenna would count those, but there's no question that, and I, I think that there's agreement in Olympia. This session, you heard all sides folks looking at ways to make it more flexible, and, and the Attorney General would agree with that. Yeah, just as a point of fact, as most of you know, there was a big effort by Governor Greg Warren, the stakeholders, to try to change 937 this session. It failed to get a consensus document, but there was a change made for biomass, and so the biomass plant of the Vista north of Spokane is now included as an eligible resource. Jay, the floor is yours. Uh, we are a very forward-looking state. I love the state of Washington for a lot of reasons, and one is we are a forward-looking state. We do not look backwards. We lead the world. We led the world in the aerospace technological revolution. We led the world in the e-commerce revolution. And now we are poised to again, uh, we are poised again to lead the world in clean energy technology. In Initiative 37, that the people of the state of Washington voted for recognizes the economic potential associated with these energy sources. And it is working. It is working. Initiative 937 has created the conditions that have been to some degree, and it's always hard to tease this out, but we've enjoyed about $7 billion of economic activity in the construction of clean energy and energy efficiency, very important things to realize, productive economic growth in the state of Washington. Now, I alluded to the wind turbines. They perhaps are the most visible signs of that economic growth. But throughout our state, we are enjoying lower energy bills, saved money, that is not going to our electrical costs because we are engaging in energy efficiency that is cost effective. And when the people voted for this, they were wise in recognizing that energy efficiency can save them money. And it is saving them hundreds of millions. Of, well, I'm not going to put a number on it because I better get a number before I use one. But if you will look at uh, the energy efficiency, you would be stunned at the money we are saving because of this. Now. I frankly don't know where my opponent stands on this. I've never heard him say whether he actually voted for this initiative or not. But I am committed to continuing our efforts to develop our economy through renewable energy sources. I supported the efforts that did go through to engage uh, bioenergy that now has allowed additional flexibility for bioenergy. And I'm seeing real support for this. In the Tacoma paper this morning, if you look at page three, the Assistant Secretary of Energy yesterday visited Simpson, which has a cogeneration plant, which is producing electricity and making money and creating jobs for cogeneration. So I'm supportive of efforts in that regard. I do think there is, is room to consider a tweak to this, that when non-growth utilities 
are buying RECs to allow them some additional flexibility to allow community-based efficiency. We might find some ways to get a bigger bang for our buck by looking at some flexibility in that regard, but not reducing the goals that we have for this very important um, um, energy project. And Jay, just to follow up on that as I did with Todd, would that be a statutory change or is that something if you were governor where you would ask the Commission and Department of Commerce to change the rules for community aggregation? It may require a statutory change. I don't okay. think that's really clear at the moment. Okay. Okay, the next series of questions is on building codes. One way of achieving greater energy efficiency, as most of us know in this room, is um, improving, upgrading building codes. We have uh, the State Building Code Council in our state that started in the 1980s. California has one, Oregon has one. California, the Energy Commission in California, recently recommended significant upgrades in building codes for energy efficiency. Governor Gregoire did place a moratorium for one year for Washington, although I must say that the rulemaking may continue. They're meeting in shoreline today to decide whether or not to launch a rulemaking. So what are your thoughts on the timing of changes to building codes and what changes would you recommend? And if not building codes, what would be the biggest source of energy efficiency? We'll start with Jay. Well, let me start with the last part of that question first about okay. efficiency. We know we have additional cost-effective efficiency in the state of Washington. If you look at some of the assessment by McKinsey report, they suggested that we've, we essentially have waste 30% of our energy that we could save on a cost-effective basis. So we know there is gold in them that are hills when it comes to energy efficiency. The question is to how do we help businesses and homeowners finance the efficiency that is cost-effective? And we know that it makes sense over time if you, if you invest a dollar, but you save three dollars on your energy costs. That's a pretty good investment if you do the, if you do the math with a present day calculation. So the question is, how do we create situations to help homeowners and businesses find capital and investment to do that? Now, I have proposed several things to do that. Number one, I hope that we will realign some of the incentives for our utilities so that in our regulatory structure for utilities, their interest in complying with the rules and the homeowner's interests are better aligned so that in fact it makes sense for them to help consumers and businesses finance these efficiency systems. And there's some improvements to do that to align the incentive structure for the utilities so that they have an incentive to help consumers and businesses make these investments first. Second, we would suggest that we have utilities have an option to, to help consumers pay for energy efficiency upgrades and pay for that over time on your utility bill. Allow the utility to become essentially a person, a, an entity to help homeowners finance those improvements. In addition, I think we've seen progress on PACE bonds, where we've allowed local municipalities and counties to effectively help homeowners finance their efficiencies and pay it back on their tax system. And that tax then runs with the, the land and it's a very, very convenient thing for the homeowner. Now here's what happens when we do this. People in the trades get work. They go to work, in fact, doing work in efficiency upgrades for homes and businesses. And we do it where it makes economic sense to do it, but we provide a financing mechanism to do that. Now, coming back to the building code itself, uh, I think that over time, the, our new technologies and the fact that we need efficiency is going to, over time, look at some improvements in our building code. I'm not confident this is the right moment, though, to call for significant changes, given the economic times that we are in, still in this period of 300,000 people unemployed and the building trade so adversely affected. So I think this will be a matter of timing, uh, probably not if, but when, that we will move forward on efficiency, but we need to do it in a time period that does not adversely affect the building code industry, excuse me, the building trades industry. Thank you. Todd? So I think the reality is, is that people already have a strong incentive to be very efficient in their buildings and reduce their energy costs. And we see it all the time. We see building efficiency going up. 
The problem is, is that when it is dictated with government inflexible regulations, you don't end up achieving the goals that you hope you achieved. In the congressman's book, he, he just written three years ago, he praised California's visionary leaders for seeing energy efficiency as a way to grow their state. California now has one of the highest unemployment rates and has a higher unemployment rate for the entire recession than the national average, an unemployment rate of 11%. And the reason that this doesn't work out is because that what ends up happening in the regulation doesn't match what's the real world. And we get told time and again that if government doesn't tell us to conserve, we won't do it ourselves because we're not smart enough. And it sort of reminds me of the Chinese proverb that the man who says it can't be done should get out of the way of the woman who is doing it. We are extremely efficient and we're seeing buildings become more efficient all the time. And let me just give you an example. In 2005, Washington State passed a law requiring all schools to meet high energy efficiency standards, what are standards like called LEED uh, or one that's a hybrid version for Washington State called the High Performance Building Standard. And they claimed that schools would see a 30 to 50 percent improvement in energy efficiency by following these standards for a very low cost that would pay off for themselves very quickly. But well, when you look at the schools across the state, in fact, not only were they not achieving those savings, that most of the green schools were less efficient, in some cases 30% less efficient per square foot than their non-green counterparts in the same school districts. And this was true in Tacoma, in Spokane, in Lake Washington School District. So finally the legislature said, what's going on here? We want the Joint uh, Legislative Audit Review Committee, which is the auditing agency for the state legislature, to look at the effectiveness of the green building requirements and the energy efficiency regulations that were put in. And what the uh, JLARC found was that of the nine schools that they look at, five of the new green schools that met these regulations were actually less efficient than the average school in those districts. And the reason is that the school districts were very good about finding efficiencies already. And so when you imposed restrictions on them, they didn't do much more. They ended up costing quite a bit, about $750,000 more per elementary school to meet the regulation, but it wasn't returning the investment. And the reason is that when you talk to the building facilities directors, they're very smart. They know that they have to cut costs. They know that they're not receiving the money, the support from the state anymore, and that they don't want to waste money on efficiencies. The man who says it can't be done should get out of the way of the woman who is doing it. And what we see time and again, and the reason that California, despite all of its efforts at efficiency, has an economy that has lower employment than Washington State significantly in the national average, is that the promise of these regulations and of programs that say, we can tell you how to do better, are not met in the real world, and that the people who are on the ground do a much better job of finding those efficiencies. Todd, just uh, uh, could you respond to the Congressman's comments on what is called decoupling, alignment of incentives, and some of the innovative financing techniques he talked about, PACE. There's a lot of talk about either attaching a lien to a home or coming up with innovative financing for energy efficiency to spur the development. Would, would, would McKenna support efforts like that or, or not? Um, to be honest, I don't, I don't know Attorney General McKenna's position on that. I can tell you that uh, the problem in terms of jobs and some of these other uh, things is, is that we had a lot of money spent on these kinds of programs where you did incentives uh, from the stimulus package and we provide homeowners incentives to do um, uh, and audits on their energy use. And what we found is, is that instead of the thousands of jobs that were created, we created a handful, dozens okay. of jobs. So I think that, okay. and I know that uh, General McKenna has been critical of those, I think that indicates that you can come up with a lot of clever ways to try to get people to do audits and improve energy efficiency, but we've actually handed them money and it hasn't worked out, so. The last question, I know the Congressman has to run to another engagement, is on smart grid. So what are your thoughts about smart grid in this state? Todd and I think, in fairness, Jay, I'll go to Todd first, or, or okay, I'll go to Todd first. Uh, most of you are aware that uh, Avista in the in the Spokane Pullman area received twenty million dollars to uh, actually more than that. There was money for Spokane, money for Pullman. The money in Spokane was on transmission upgrades. The money in Pullman is actually on meters to the home and trying to incent consumers to change their behavior. So uh, Avista is in the process of doing that now and looking at cost effectiveness, reliability, and potential acceleration in the future. What would, what would uh, Attorney General McKenna do about smart grid and smart grid investments? 
Uh, Attorney General McKenna is very supportive of the notion of smart grid on a, on a number of levels. And, and not only is Washington State a leader in this, uh, with Pacific Northwest National Labs in the Tri-Cities, but actually the Olympic Peninsula has been a leader in this. PNNL actually ran a study on the Olympic Peninsula, giving people smart meters and some appliances that would fluctuate based on uh, the price of energy. And people could choose with just a simple slider, I want to use all the electricity I want, or manage my electricity and thermostat and other things so that I'm getting the best rates. And just that simple thing in the test here on the Olympic Peninsula found that you could cut uh, energy use by 10%. Think of all the things that we do to try to get these small incremental improvements in energy efficiency and just a simple application of smart grid and giving the consumers control and giving them some price mechanism had 10% reduction. It's really a remarkable opportunity and we're seeing Avista and PSC and a variety of other folks engage in these prod, uh, projects. Smart grid is, is a very uh, exciting idea that not only will improve um, the stability uh, of the system that we have, but put more power in the hands of consumers to figure out ways that they uh, can save energy. It's not all just reliant on uh, PSC handing out light bulbs and, and other things like that, um, that each consumer has it in their own, own hands because only you know what works for you how you can save energy, whether it's turning off lights, whether it's turning off TV, whether it's getting more efficient appliances, right? Some people cook a lot. Getting very efficient appliances may work for them and save a lot of money. Other people don't cook so much, in which case those appliances aren't going to help them very much. But when you get to choose and fit your lifestyle, and Smart Grid gives you the opportunity to do that, and I think it's really exciting. And like I said, it, Washington is already a leader in this area. The, the key question, though, is how do you pay for it? and it's going to take a very long time to put this into effect. We are spending huge amounts of money on conservation projects that are returning very small uh, returns on our investment in terms of conservation. I think it's time to look at using the money that we have in the best way possible for all the technologies, whether it's conservation, whether it's smart grid and those sorts of things, because all of those things combined together are what's going to have the impact of improving energy efficiency overall and allowing you to have control um, rather than just requiring, you know, these targets in conservation, these targets here and there. Regulatory approach doesn't always work. Giving people the power to do it, giving people uh, who are on the ground uh, the access to that information is very extreme. It's very powerful, as we've seen right here. Before I let you go, just two other questions. Yeah. Privacy is privacy an issue? I mean, we're involved in this issue, and I know the yeah. congressman is too. There's a lot of it opens it up to the internet world, and there are concerns that consumers, ratepayers, are are expressing about privacy, and then the RF issue, the radio magnetic. Uh, radiation concern that has expressed itself in Marin County, California, and other areas. Is Attorney General McKenna up? Is he concerned about those issues as we go to broader deployment of that, of, uh, of the technology? Ha having lived in Marin County when I was very young, um, it doesn't surprise me that they're worried about the RF issue, but um, uh, I personally, I don't know how the Attorney General feels about that. Okay. I'm less concerned about right. that. The privacy issue, though, um, you know, the, the, the many utilities across the state are already sending you bills that say you are using more energy than your neighbors. Yeah, so that comes all, from a company called O Power, yeah. and uh, that's called behavior modification. Yeah, so they're yeah. already looking at that. Um, I, I think that if you give consumers power, um, they um, uh, will appreciate that, and if there are privacy concerns, I'm convinced that we can address them. Um, I think that you don't make the perfect the enemy of the good, um, and okay. the power that has come through the smart grid to give consumers, I think, is, is, is clearly a good thing. Okay. Jay? Um, well, I appreciate Todd recognizing that uh, I got one right in my book, uh, because I talked <laughs> extensively about, uh, as I recall, the smart grid applications that are now creating jobs at ITRON and Spokane and a host of other companies in the state of Washington. Um, by the way, I've got to take some issue, Todd, with your assertion that the collapse of the Western uh, economies was a result of my book. It's, I thought that was a little <laughs> stretch. Um, I, said, I just said, I, I just said I Western actually, economy. I actually think the collapse of our economy is because of some misbehavior on Wall Street. I think that was a bigger reason that we have a recession. And 
I wish more people had listened to me when I voted against the deregulation of Wall Street that the Republicans embraced in mass, that regulation was a terrible thing, awful thing, constrains capitalism in all its circumstances. Uh, I was one of only 55 who voted against the deregulation of Wall Street, and now what I hear is a very ideologically consistent opinion of the party that is against taking action to deal with our obvious economic opportunities in clean energy. There is a difference in the, in the candidates, and I think Todd has had a difficult uh, job to do, and he's done an admirable job today because my opponent's record is pretty much non-existent on energy issues, so he's done a good job trying to fill it in. Look, I believe smart grid is a huge economic potential for us. It is a huge economic potential because every time we waste energy, Every time we have the use of utility in our homes that in fact is at a time where it is not efficient, we are losing money. This is an economic uh, sieve for us. And the smart meter can put energy and watts to work when in fact we need them best. And it is a huge opportunity for us. Now the difference is between the approaches here is that I actually want to do something about it rather than just kind of give some rhetorical flourishes to it. That's why I did vote for the stimulus bill that did put money into research, that did do the kind of things that Todd is talking about, and actually do something about it. And as a result of those investments, we have companies in this state that are putting people to work today. You look at the Energy 2 company on the shores of Lake Union, it's the world's leading company on ultra capacitors that you can put on your lithium ion battery and electric cars. My party believes in the power of innovation to move this country forward. My country believes in the ability that we can grow our economy through the lithium ion battery. Several years ago, we had 2% of the market share in the world in lithium ion batteries. But I went to work to try to help to get an investment in the stimulus bill. Today we have, I think, 40% of the world's market share in lithium ion batteries. And yesterday, Elon Musk, the guy who put the rocket ship using private enterprise into outer space, launched a car that can go 300 miles on a charge in a lithium ion battery. We believe in action. We believe in the future, and we believe in the power of the state of Washington to use clean energy as a springboard to economic development. And we're going to put muscle behind that and innovation in a lot of different ways. And I look forward to working with all you to do that, to see a thousand flowers bloom when it comes to uh, the smart grid. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I think we've run out of time. The congressman has another appointment to go to, so um, if you have any any last words, Jay or Todd, maybe 30 seconds to a minute? Would you say it? And then we'll uh, end this session. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank you. I just want to thank everyone for caring about this. Uh, I want to ask for your advice. Uh, there's a lot of talent in this room. And I hope if this has spurred any suggestions or critiques, you will share them with us. I'm in the market of looking for good ideas. And last, uh, I want to ask you for your vote. We can do some great things in this state if we have a great governor that will keep us moving forward. Thank you very much. Don, 30, Jay? I also appreciate the opportunity to be here. As I said, I have a personal connection to community colleges and the work that they do. They've made a difference in my life, and I know that they will make a difference in a lot of others, and so does Attorney General McKenna, which is why he wants to increase funding for community colleges, for education. And I think the choice is very clear between the two, view, two visions of the future economy and a clean energy. Did the things that happened in Spain, in Grays Harbor, in California, that Jay praised just three years ago, did they work out or did they not? Or should we follow an idea, a notion that says that all of the ideas, the various ways of becoming more energy efficient um, should be welcome and embraced and encouraged and educated? That's the approach that Attorney General McKenna will, will support, and it's why I'm hoping that you'll join me in, in voting for him. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Jack. Thanks, Thanks for coming. Okay. Thank you, Todd.